I'm going to briefly talk us through um, this new guidance for responsible use of AI in evidence synthesis called RAISE. Um, and I should give us a little bit of background, first of all. Um, a few of us have been to various meetings and webinars over the last year or so. Uh, and lots of people said, what we need is guidance on these new tools. How can we use these new tools? And we thought, yeah, that's true. We should write some guidance. That would be helpful. So we went away and did some homework in order to try and write the guidance. And we found actually it was very difficult to do. Um, basically, the main problem was there are a lot of new tools out there, lots of tools um, being developed and marketed at systematic reviewers for use. And the evidence base on which to write guidance for their use is very thin to non-existent. And we were finding that the pace of tool development was vastly outpacing both the ability of, of us to keep up with validation studies and evaluation studies, but also the tools themselves were not being, um, you know, the tool developers were not evaluating their tools. And so it was really difficult at the beginning to say, okay, so um, this tool is safe for use in this context, and this is a good idea to use this tool in that context because we just lacked the evidence base. And you know, this is an ecosystem challenge. What we have at the moment is an awful lot of energy, an awful lot of enthusiasm, and it has to be said, an awful lot of hype, a lot of money going into um, generative AI tool production. Uh, but what we lack here is really a solid foundation for basing um, decisions about use. So after having discovered that we needed an evidence base that we did, but we didn't have one, um, we started to think about, well, okay, so what do we need to do to move from this position where we are at the moment of having lots of interesting tools, lots and lots of developments and enthusiasm, um, but no evidence to support its use. And we also were finding um, that there were tools that were being developed, and I'm sure we've all come across some of these tools that are being developed, which are running counter to a whole heap of evidence which has underpinned evidence synthesis for the last 30 or so years. And so there are there are big issues such as publication bias, which you know we've we've investigated as a field over time. We know what it is and we know the steps that we take to minimize those kinds of biases. But some of these tools that are coming through now magnify publication bias, for example. And so there's a need to connect both ourselves with an evidence base and develop an evidence base, but also there's a need to connect the people who are doing the evidence synthesis work with those who are producing these tools so that we can have a better fit for purpose in terms of tool development and the context of use, in, in this case, uh, reliable evidence synthesis. So as Anna said, we do need to support this wider adoption of AI because we're basically drowning in research at the moment. We can't do evidence synthesis at the scale and the speed that we need to be able to do it. Um, but we also need a cross-field standards. We need an evidence base. And in order to do that, we need to start thinking about how we can work together on it. And so we've evolved this concept of this ecosystem of roles. And you can see in this, this graphic here that um, a colleague of mine, Caitlin Hare, put together. Um, which articulates these different roles. There are, you know, there's people who do evidence synthesis, the evidence synthesists, as we've called them, so it fits in the box here. Um, there are methodologists who develop best practice guidance for evidence synthesis. There's the people who develop the tools. There's the people who fund both the evidence synthesis and tool development. Organizations such as Cochrane, um, that produces the evidence synthesis, people who train people who do evidence synthesis and who are interested in the field, users of the evidence synthesis and the publishers of evidence synthesis. And so the way that we've un understood this is that each has a role to play in mutually supporting one another to build this ecosystem where we build an evidence base, a cumulative evidence base, um, but also where we engage with tool development and so that the tool developers themselves have more security in terms of what they need um, to develop in order for it to be to be used in production. Critically though, one person or one organization may play multiple roles at any one time. So for example, I, I do evidence synthesis, 
Simon Evidence Synthesis, some of my time, um, some of my time, I'm a methodologist. I do work in evidence of this methodology and I wear that hat when I do that. And sometimes I write Python code and I'm involved in development. And so at that point, I'm in, in the team. So it's in the development team. So it's quite important that these are not individual people. Sometimes people will play different roles, but it's actually quite useful to sort of separate the role that I'm playing at, at a particular point in time um, from you know, the, the range of roles that um, I might play within this ecosystem. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to go through in a little bit of detail just um, two of the main roles that we've got, no doubt, on the webinar today, the evidence synthesists and the evidence synthesis methodologists, and also organizations producing evidence synthesis like Campbell and Cochrane, JPI, um, CE, and the like. So thinking about the evidence synthesis, those of us who are reviewers or authors of evidence synthesis systematic reviews, and one of the sort of like the bottom lines that we've always got to um, come back to is that we are responsible for the evidence synthesis that we conduct. Um, whilst we may un use different tools, we may work as part of a team, you know, it's our name that's on the review and we have to be accountable for what we've done. So it's, it's no good sort of hiding behind an AI tool and saying, oh, well, you know, um, the reason that uh, I missed half of the studies in this review is because I used that tool. You know, it's my choice to use that tool. So I'm responsible for it. Um, and part of that, you know, when I'm using one of those tools is to report transparently how I've used it and as well as transparently saying how I've used it to justify why I've used it in that way. What is the evidence base that underpins my decision to use that tool? If I can't cite an evidence base which says to an external reviewer, uh, yes, this was a valid and responsible use of a tool in my review, then you know the peer reviewer shouldn't pass the paper as peer review. I've got to be able to justify why I have a, have a good expectation that the tool will perform as expected in my review. There's a lot of um, legal, ethical, regulatory standards to consider um, when we're um, considering using a tool and also when we're using tools. Uh, there are various copyright um, issues which are quite complicated and there's sort of terms of use of both tools and of databases and that kind of thing. So there's, this, is a, this is an area where the legal context is quite complicated and also in terms of regions and different organizations have different um, standards and contracts with different suppliers. So it's, it's quite important that we, we think about this before sort of jumping in and using a tool. Um, and also there are some particularly important ethical issues around the use of some of these tools from some of the suppliers. Um, some of you know, one, one of the um, oft talked about issues is around the way that a lot of these large language models have essentially been generated um, off vast quantities of data scraped off the internet without um, the publisher's um, permission. Um, there's, there's ethical issues around that, but there's also ethical issues around the way that they've been trained and also the biases that they've encoded. And so we need to consider when choosing a tool um, and look at you know, the, the degree to which different um, tool developers have actually engaged with some of those issues, um, not least of which, of course, are the environmental issues um, in terms of the, the, like the cost um, and the carbon imprint of of some of the large server farms that are being um, established at the moment. So the the bottom um, number point number four on contributing to the ecosystem is is something which all the roles have got, and you know the evidence synthesists in the, within this ecosystem have a really key role, obviously in terms of trying tools, getting feedback on tools, but also data. We are all producing lots and lots of data as evidence synthesists, and that is actually really important to developers in terms of um, developing and validating new tools. So if we want good tools fit for our purposes to be developed, one of the things that we can do is to make sure that we share our data whenever possible with, with developers so that they can understand the, sort of like the, the accuracy that we're looking for and they can test and validate their tools. In terms of methodologists, so those of us wearing a methodology hat, um, there are open science practices which we should try to um, adhere to when um, doing carrying out evaluations. And so that's easy enough 
sometimes for those of us in an academic environment. But remember that the roles are not people. Those These are roles that are being played. And so when you're a tool developer and you're validating a tool, you are actually playing a methodology role at that point as well. And so what we see an awful lot at the moment is sort of validation and research studies which are basically marketing. They don't adhere to sort of even standard principles of open science. You can't replicate some of these research studies or so-called research studies which um, are being put out there. And so one of the things that would be really nice to do would be engagement between evidence synthesis methodologists and people developing tools and trying to get a little bit more science into what at the moment looks more like marketing in terms of, um, of research and performance statistics on some of the tools. So we want to carry out these objective and partial evaluations. And in order to do that, um, well, we need to build a cumulative evidence base. And so what we've got at the moment is a situation where we've got lots of individual studies. So, you know, I'm not knocking them, they're very good, a lot of them. But they're isolated, they use different data sets, ask different questions, use different methods, use different language models, and they're very, very different to sort of put together and say, okay, so what does the evidence base as a whole say? So there's, as Anna mentioned, studies within a review, there are now becoming templates for carrying out some of these studies, where if we actually organize ourselves and say, okay, and it saves, my, saves us um, you know, trouble as well, it, gives, it saves us work, that we can take a pre-existing template of how to do a particular validation study and then just use it. Um, and if we use that and use them consistently, then we build a cumulative evidence base that, you know, we can do evidence synthesis ourselves on, our, on, our, on these methodology studies. And what that will mean is that we've got a much firmer evidence base on which we can develop best practice standards and then link and communicate with developers in terms of the expectations that we've got. So the my last um, organization um, slide on this is the organizations. And you know, we, we've got the, the evidence coming from reviewers doing reviews, the data, we've got the methodologists doing the validation studies, developing best practice standards. And then that can then feed into organizations who can pick up the best practice standards and then consider implementation standards and implementation and integration. How do you actually then put them into practice? So we've got a whole lot of you know, guidance in terms of developing an evidence base here, but then actually what's absolutely critical is at an organizational level, thinking about how we implement them, how we promote them, how we support responsible use of AI in, in different organizations. And of course, part of that is monitoring that. You know, we don't just sort of write some guidance and leave it. We've got to um, consider um, active monitoring so that we know you know, we can we can chart progress and we can identify problems. So there are now they went up today um, three new papers um, on the open science framework and that QR code should take you to them. There's document one, which is recommendations for practice, and that goes to each of those roles that I've talked about and um, articulates the recommendations in a lot more detail than I've taken you through here. Document two then is a supporting document, which is around building and evaluating evidence synthesis tools and also contains guidance about how to report um, evaluation studies. And then the third document is a very user facing document, which is around selecting and using evidence synthesis tools. So there's a, over 30 authors and organizations on um, these documents now. Um, and we're very interested in feedback. That's why it's on the Open Science Framework. So do go and take a look and, and let us know what you think. Um, we will be revising them again before too long, I'm sure.